Hey everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Matt Bonjovi, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Oliver Rader. Oliver is a journalist and author who has been a senior writer at 538 and editor of the Riddler Puzzle Column, a collection of endlessly entertaining math puzzles. Oliver recently studied artificial intelligence as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and holds a PhD in economics with a focus on game theory. Oliver is here with us today to discuss his newest book, Seven Games, A Human History, which is a biography of seven enduring and beloved games from chess to poker to go and a few others. In his book, Oliver examines the story of why and how we humans play these games. He delves into the delightful arcana of their rules and looks at the interplay between elite champions of these games and the emerging AI players that have come to dominate in several realms. Now, throughout our talk, you might have some great questions popping into your head. And when you do, please go ahead and add them to the chat on the right. We will have time shortly for Oliver to answer some of these, so be sure to get your questions in early. But first, Oliver, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So your book does a great job of both looking in depth at these seven games that you present, while also being thoughtful on some of the big, almost philosophical questions around gaming. Uh, one of those questions that I want to start with is, why do we play games? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, a natural one. Why did I write a whole book about these things? <laughs> yeah. um, I think there's a constellation um, of answers. I think the simplest but maybe least satisfactory answer is that games are fun. Games yeah. are ways to, to occupy our time in an enjoyable way. But I think there's there's deeper, more interesting answers as well. Um, one of these is, is that games are practice. So there's um, a famous story that I was told many times when I was reporting this book. Um, imagine that you're a prehistoric human and you have to hunt to gather food. And there's a few ways you could go about this. You could hunt all the time, but this is incredibly dangerous. Uh, you could never hunt, but that's no good either because then you never get any good at hunting. Or you could invent a game, uh, throw this rock at that tree, first person to hit it wins. And the ga this game is a way to sort of practice for the real world. And indeed today, in sort of rather uh, less violent times, <laughs> games are still practice. They distill elements of the real world. So a game like chess uh, allows us to practice uh, strategy and planning ahead. Uh, a game like backgammon allows us to grapple with the uncertainty of the world via the rolls of a dice. A game like poker, uh, we're confronted with hidden information and deception uh, and on and on. So games are sort of a, a form of practice for the real world. And the third answer that I would throw into the mix is, is that games are an art form and that playing games is a form of, of art appreciation. And I mean that in, in not in a grandiose way, but in, in a literal way. So whereas, you know, painting captures the visual world and music captures the, the heard world, games capture agency, human agency, this these sort of modes of uh, deciding and deliberating and, and acting. And um, and we we humans uh, like art appreciation. And I think game, games are, are one uh, mode of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, that point about agency, because it's also, it seems like you can uh, interact in ways that you wouldn't necessarily in, like, your everyday life. You can kind of create these scenarios where you can exercise a different kind of agency. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's it's not often that, you know, I get to, like, lead an army into battle <laughs> right? <laughs> in, my, in the real world, um, probably for the best. But, you know, when I play chess or stratego or you know any any sort of modern um game that takes place in in that milieu like i can do right and um yeah we get we get to we get to occupy uh states of agency that that aren't otherwise available to us i think that's a great point that's certainly another appeal yeah and are you practicing to lead an army somewhere? Is that something that we should be concerned about? <laughs> I'm not at liberty to talk about that at the moment. <laughs> That's a good answer. But I will. But I will say that I think that I do think that the the border between games and real life is a, a porous one. Um, I think that we do legitimately learn things from games and take them to our real lives. I can 
tell you, give you a personal example, which is I used to be deeply, deeply obsessed with Scrabble. Right. And the key uh, dynamic in Scrabble is uh, an intertemporal one, a trade-off between today and tomorrow, or in Scrabble, this turn and the next turn, this bow, this sort of dynamic pro programming problem, like scoring points today, leaving yourself good tiles for next turn. And I think I very legitimately think I learned lessons about like saving and being kind to my future self uh, yeah. through my Scrabble obsession. So I think I think this is this is a real a real thing, and I'm I'm sure I'm not alone. Yeah, yeah. Because also with the scope of games, there's that like immediate payoff or like damage where you're like, oh, I should have saved that S until next turn. Like you don't have to wait the way that you do in life sometimes to get hit in the face with your mistake. That's right. The lessons and the lessons come come fast and furious. Like I can I can play play a lot of games of Scrabble, yeah, or a lot of hands of poker or, or whatever it is, and there's sort of these miniature crystallized um, little models of the world. Yeah, definitely. Now, from the very earliest days of computing, researchers and programmers have been tinkering with games. Why, even early on, was there this natural marriage between computing and games? Well, again, I think there's a few answers. I think one is sort of what, we're, what we've already been talking about. I think if games are practice for the real world for humans, games are practice for the real world for computers. Um, they, they're they appealing to computer scientists for a number of reasons. One is, you know, they're small and manageable. You can, again, just like us humans, you can play a lot of them in a row. Um, they're very easily measurable. So you can you can put a computer against another computer and games have winners and losers. And that's that's data that you're generating. Or you can put a computer versus a human. And if the computer wins, well, hey, in this very limited domain, I have very good reason to suspect this computer is better than the human. And I think closely related to that is games, um, chess seemingly chief among them, has long been sort of tied up with the concept of intelligence itself. So if you look back at you know the, the document proposing this famous AI uh, symposium at Dartmouth in the 50s, and they said, we, we envision computers doing you know, the highest callings of humankind. And they listed them and it was like writing music and proving mathematical theorems and playing chess. These were like the three things they wanted um, their AI to be able to do. So I think it's it's practical. On the one hand, it's practical. Games are a very practical thing to unleash your, your system on. And two, it's sort of this romantic notion of this high this high these higher ideals of of humanity. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And kind of going into some of the earlier AIs around games, you talk in your book about um, checkers and some of the early um, projects around building AI uh, that can play checkers and win at checkers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, there, as long as there have been computers, uh, they've, they've played games, um, yeah. more or less. I mean, you had, you know, guys like Arthur Samuel on the first big IBM mainframes was, was testing the IBM machines with his checkers program, pitting two of these, you know, uh, refrigerator sized things against each other and sleeping in the IBM factory, watching these machines play checkers yeah. and checkers. Um, checkers is the first chapter in, in my book and has a really fascinating story. I think checkers gets a real, a real bad rap as sort of, you know, a, a child's game, a sort of pre chess, sort of yeah. this, this thing that's, you know, limited to what indoor recess when you're in elementary right. school or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, but Checkers was was this first real real test of, of machines and sort of, um, you know, the computer programmers started figuring out like you know how do I quickly and efficiently like traverse the tree that is a game of checkers? How do I accurately um, evaluate positions on this tree once I get to them? And sort of yeah, Checkers was it was the site of a lot of really seminal uh, computer science. And the site of, of an absolutely fantastic sort of, I was about to say human versus machine, but really human versus human um, battle that I talk about in that first chapter. Yeah. And one of the things that the um, that you talk about again in the chapter is that the uh, AIs were initially able to find certain positions that had potentially um, 
eluded human understanding or not uh, sort of the human record on on checkers. Can you tell us a bit about um, the the term cooks that you have and why those moves were important for the game of checkers? Yeah, cooks is one of these like fantastic uh, game, pieces of game jargon uh, yeah. that I really love. So uh, a cook comes uh, most likely comes from the phrase um, uh, your goose is cooked, as in your your checkers opponent's goose is cooked and Checkers, like like I think every game in my book and, and many games, um, has its own literature, um, sort of, you know, a, accumulated human wisdom of how the game ought to be played, what's what are good opening moves and what are bad opening moves, and so on. In some cases, these books are many volumes long, um, dense with checkers moves. And a cook is uh, a, a good move that is is not in in the literature. So a cook is something that you can unleash um, to your opponent's uh, surprise. Um, because the thing about checkers is so so many games are drawn, even more so at the highest levels than chess, where there's a lot of draws. And one win is, is hugely important in checkers. So you 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 spend all your time hunting hunting down cooks. And indeed, um, that's what uh, Jonathan Schaefer, a computer scientist still at the University of Alberta, uh, set his computer program to work doing, hunting down these cooks, these little pieces of checkers knowledge that that had escaped um, the accumulated uh, human wisdom. Right. So at the highest level, these these checkers players would have gone through this literature a number of times and, and would know kind of almost intuitively the set of moves that have been done before. And, and when there's something that's completely different, that would be such a strategic advantage in those moments. Yeah, that's exactly right. And mathematically speaking, um, checkers is simpler than chess, of course, but its top players make up for that difference by, by looking deeper into the game. 20, 30, 40 moves ahead is not uncommon for, for a top checkers player to be able to, to search um, his or herself uh, into the future of the game. So yeah, so so much of that tree was was fairly well known via memorization or or study or, or whatever else. But occasionally, you know, there'd be a branch or a twig that that had escaped, you know, to belabor the metaphor, all the human climbs up this up this tree, there would be a path that that had been invisible and and eventually um, someone or or some uh, machine uh, could discover it. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned, you alluded to that there was this kind of face-off between um, uh, the Checkers AI and the human story. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and specifically what it was like after um, this this AI had uh, done battle with the human? Right, so uh, Schaefer, Jonathan Schaefer's uh, program was called Chinook, which uh, is named after a wind that blows through Canada. Uh, the reason why it was called that is uh, Checkers is... Uh, in some parts of the world called drafts, so wind, draft. Um, and this was his life's project, quite literally his professional life's project for, for almost two decades. This was what he did. And as his program, uh, Chinook, got better and better at checkers, um, Schaefer wanted to test it against the best human in the world because, you know, what computer scientists wouldn't. And he learned of a man named Marion Tinsley, who is the best, was uh, the best checkers player uh, in the world. And I would go further and say, I think there's a very strong argument that he was the best competitor at any competitive pursuit in the history of the world. Uh, over a 40 year stretch of play, uh, comprising some 1000 tournament games, Tinsley lost exactly three times. Um, so of course, you know, Schaefer wants to beat this guy with Chinook and what ensues, I won't spoil too much of chapter one, but what ensues is really triumphant and heartbreaking and devastating and heroic sort of friendly battle between the two. And as a chapter in the book, just like kind of could not have worked better because, uh, the, because Marion Tinsley, uh, while the chapter is unfolding, is growing old, uh, like every human does, and he will do what every human does, which is die. And uh, Schaefer is essentially racing against against the clock to to beat this aging um, checkers master. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I think it's what you mentioned there about Tinsley's um, record is quite impressive. The level of dominance that he showed in that game um, is extraordinary. And I think, again, it's we think of checkers as this sort of juvenile game, as you mentioned. But to have one person at the highest level um, being so competitive for so long is quite extraordinary. Yeah, and you see that, you know, you see these sort of um, super outlying competitors in, in games and, and some sports from time to time. I think he's really an outlier among among outliers and how was he able to do this? I, I'm not sure. He had, he had two, two great loves in his life. One was checkers and one was um, God. He was a very devout Christian and um, an evangelical minister. And these seemed to be the things that occupied him entirely. And his devotion to checkers was seemed to be just as strong as his devotion to um to his Christian religion, and he devoted time uh, as equally faithfully to both, and seemed to live, live and breathe, kind of both at the same time. Yeah, and as those early AIs became competitive, how did the players uh, in checkers and then other games start to utilize um, AI in their gameplay? Yeah, I think in most games you see a pattern that repeats um, fairly regularly, fairly regularly game to game, which is at first, the machine is treated with utter disdain. Right. Um, no, no machine, says the checkers uh, player, <laughs> could ever do what I do, right? Yeah. That, fairly, that fairly quickly dissolves uh, once, once they start losing to the machine. And, you know, the smart players quickly realize, well, hey, I can learn something from this thing. And so, for example, Chinook, the checkers playing machine, um, discovered, discovered things that weren't in the human books or discovered things that were wrong in the human books and imparted these lessons fairly quickly um, to, to the human players. And I think we see this in, in almost every game, this pretty, pretty rapid transition from, you know, what the heck is this machine doing here to, hey, can I have that machine so, so that I can learn from it? Yeah. Yeah, it's quite extraordinary. I think also the the pace at which change can happen when, um, obviously, when it's humans, you have um, s often centuries or uh, even longer of history of playing this game, but you can only play so much so quickly. So then when you have this extra piece where you can have um, this additional knowledge come so quickly, humans themselves can then uh, improve quite at quite dramatic rates. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this, I think this is one of the most profound effects of AI in the games context is the democratization of skill in games. And as you say, quite rightly, the acceleration of the dissemination of knowledge about a game. So you can get, anyone can get good. Whereas maybe before you had to live near a good chess club or have a chess, a good chess teacher around or be able to afford one. Um, now anyone can become, be, become good. And anyone can become good really, really quickly. And I think, um, I mean, as a lover of games, I think this is wonderful. And I think getting even a little bit good at games just opens that game up so much to you. You can really see what that game is about and, and increases enjoyment. So I think um, I think that's right. This sort of democratization of, of skill and just a broad-based increase in the level of play in, in tournaments and, and at the competitive level. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things you talk about in your book, specifically with regards to chess, is that not only does it democratize the skill, but it also democratizes the ability to be a fan of the game. Um, and you talk specifically about like uh, chess tournaments that then have um, this uh, AI aided indicator of the strength of different moves. And you can you can then more easily follow along and understand that, oh, what someone just did is actually a, a really good move or a really bad move without having to be able to see the game the way that those players do in the depth that they do. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I, I think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword and I'll explain why, <laughs> but to, yeah, to sort of set the scene. So I, for example, have covered the last three world chess championships um, for uh, 538 where I uh, used to work. And yeah, I would I would watch along with, with the engine as chess AIs are, are usually called. And yeah, on the side of the little picture of the chessboard on my computer screen is what sort of looks like a thermometer. And it will be, you know, if white is winning, it fills up more white. And if black is winning, it fills up more black and can twitch back and forth. 
and this is really wonderful for you know a, a sort of middling novice uh, journalist uh, like me, uh, novice at chess, and um, I can sort of get a sense of of what's going on in a sort of snapshot way. The the downside, I think, is it could trick me into thinking I know everything, right? Oh, I see the thermometer move up, you know, wow, what a terrible move <laughs> by white or by black, whatever. And I think it's important to sort of use computer analysis as a sort of one component of a sort of menu of, of, of tools. Because if you can't explain, you know, if you can't explain why the digital thermometer ticked this way or that, um, you, you might be relying on it uh, uh, too heavily, which I think, you know, that maybe this is, we don't need to get, this is a very long answer probably, but this is a, a big problem with with AI in, in a lot of contexts in my view is this sort of um, uh, black box issue where, you know, I see the output, but I don't understand um, the reasoning. And, and, and that crops up uh, here and there in games too. Yeah, yeah, that explainability issue does come up even in your book a few times with respect to games. I'm curious, from the journalist perspective, you were mentioning that like having that indication of the strength of moves can be this double-edged sword. Does it, does that at all influence the importance of like the narrative that you're telling from the journalistic perspective, or does it? Do you think it helps or hurts that, or makes it more important that you need to stress the narrative? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think it's a, a useful tool, but one one tool of many. Um, so one uh, one way we did use that, um, and I say we because I was assisted by excellent editors and data viz people, um, was a sort of a timeline of every game, move by move, how this evaluation changed over time um, as, as each of what ended up being 11 games in the most recent world championship unfolded. You know, and some of them look like the game has flatlined. Some of them look like cardiac arrest. And, you know, they, they give this nice snapshot of, of what the game was like. Was it exciting? Was it, you know, like a winning winning percentage uh, uh, went dramatically up and down, say, in NFL weekend recently. Yeah. Um, so it's one, it's one tool of many. It gives you a snapshot of sort of who's ahead and who's behind and very very useful to sort of get your quick bearings. But, you know, as, as any, um, I think, a good journalist in whatever field would do is, you know, you try to talk, talk to folks, you listen to the players comments after the game, um, see if they can explain what they were thinking, talk to other um, uh, strong grandmasters, get their take on, on this move or that. And um, yeah, just try to try to assemble a collage um, and, and uh, from a lot of different sources. And, and I've been really lucky that um, a lot of chess players much, much, much stronger than me are, are willing to, to sort of hold my hand and, and walk me through it. Yeah. As an aside, I heard that you have played Magnus Carlsen before. Is that true? Yeah, it was one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, not, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but like, how did that go? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was uh, occurred under sort of um, mysterious circumstances. I assume um, they had gotten wind of my of my chess writing and I was invited to the headquarters of the United Nations, um, which already was a weird day. And it was a, as I, it wasn't just me. It was a simultaneous exhibition. I was one of many victims. And I, if I'm remembering correctly, I lasted 29 moves, but that's dramatically overstated. I mean, the game was over. <laughs> Far, far my king almost ended up on the entirely opposite side of the board but i did put magnus carlson in check oh, which wow. is i think something uh no one will will ever be able to take away from me yeah did you just stand up and yell out check <laughs> uh I, I wasn't quite i thought i thought of doing that um <laughs> i resisted uh but i did i did delude myself uh and games are real fertile um garden of delusion i did delude myself for half a second in, into thinking yeah I, i'm gonna but of course yes, there, yeah there was never any chance that's fair so i, I do want to talk about the, this most recent world chess championship last month um one of the things from that is that we saw three of the most accurately played chess games in championship history what does that mean first from a technical standpoint and then what does that mean for how chess is played and the game of chess moving forward right so that's exactly right. Um, three of the, the most accurately played games out of, I think, on the order of a thousand world championship games that have been played in history. And yeah, what does this mean? Well, basically, the, 
um, the engines, the computer players are so good these days that, you know, essentially for these purposes, indistinguishable from perfect. So you run the actual world championship um, games through the engine and the engine spits out something called uh, average centipon loss, where centipon is kind of what it sounds like, a, a hundredth of a pawn. So they measure how much did your move differ from the optimal computer move in centipons. And I, I don't remember exactly, but the average centipon losses in these games is something like two or three, very, very tiny slivers of a pawn. Right. And yeah, why were they able to do this? Well, it's because more or less they're, they're mimicking the play of the very computer that is judging their play in terms of average centipon loss. So humans are slowly but surely, I think, asymptotically kind of approaching this, this computer driven ideal play. And that's had, that's had a wide variety of effects on the game of chess at, at the highest levels. Um, one is, well, it's really, really impressive how good humans play. Like that's first and foremost, that it's really amazing that they can play play so well under the pressure of the world championship and being, you know, televised and streamed and all that stuff. Two, it can, this um, effect, this phenomenon can be fairly frustrating um, for the viewer and for uh, the, occasionally for the players themselves. Why? Well, it, it has the tendency to lead to a lot of draws. Um, so it's, this is not, uh, mathematically proven, but, uh, many suspect that perfectly played chess is a guaranteed draw, much like perfectly played tic-tac-toe or checkers is a guaranteed draw. So two very, very good equally matched players lead to a lot of draws. Some chess draws can be absolutely fascinating, um, encounters, no doubt about it, but many, uh, are not. And it's, I think somewhat difficult to maintain a sort of a robust ecosystem of viewership and of fandom in a world where where many high level games are drawn uh, in somewhat um, rote fashion, perfect though the play uh, may have been. And um, for players too, I think this can be frustrating. So one thing if you watch a, a World Chess Championship match that you'll often hear the commentators talk about is, well, uh, he's still in his prep meaning he is still mimicking move by move com computer driven preparation that he or she did before the match began. So uh, one of the recent world uh, chess championship competitors was uh, Jan Nepomnici, a Russian grandmaster, who said after one game that he had seen the entire game on his computer in his preparation before he played it. Right. So humans have sort of been transfigured from um, performer to sort of um, not a perfect analogy, but hard drive sort of um, essentially memorizing lines that were analyzed and vetted by the computer and then remembering them and then playing them the next day or later that day uh, on the board. And this has, um, this has led to frustration, um, both private and publicly stated. And one, I think, um, Side effect of this has been Magnus Carlsen, who won the World Chess Championship, announced shortly after he won the World Chess Championship that, that he might not defend his title. And a lot of this indeed had to do with uh, seemingly with frustration with, with the format. Right. And just that almost uh, tedious sort of ordeal that, that they have to go through to play these matches that all seemingly end in a draw. Right, exactly. And one thing... That, that Carlson has advocated for and, and many other um, chess sort of players and, and commentators is, well, you could just play faster games, right? In the world championship, they play what's called classical chess, which can last, I think the longest game was something like seven or eight hours. And this allows the players sort of ample time to dig through the memory banks and think like, what am I supposed to do in this rare line of the Spanish game or whatever. But speed chess is kind of the chess of the moment. Chess is having its, its uh, sort of this blossoming moment online where everybody plays speed chess. And if you're playing speed chess, you are forced to sort of rely uh, less on your memory and your prep and uh, more on your sort of human intuition and the sort of raw, fast twitch chess skill. Um, so that's one argument, one um, proposal to sort of shake up the format. And there's more 
sort of more um, violent interventions that would decrease reliance on on memory, which is, uh, for example, there's something called uh, Chess 960 or Fisher Random, where some of the pieces are randomized before the game even begins, obviously uh, lessening the value of, of any kind of memorization you, you might have wanted to do. Right. So the pieces are just when you start them, they're in a random order that matches. Yeah. So the, the pawns all stay the same and, and the, all the uh, more major pieces are in their same uh, rank. But right. within that rank, the orders are randomized and the other players' pieces, pieces match. So it's still uh, symmetric in that way. And uh, called chess 960 because there are 960 possible uh, starting positions. Right. Right. That makes sense. And and you mentioned there that like speed chess has has kind of been taken off because it creates this um, lack of ability to to search your memory banks and come up with the with the right moves. Um, and we even saw that like in some of the moments of clock trouble in this world championship showed um, to be quite interesting moments as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there was one really, really good game in the world chess championship one and beyond that all time classic <laughs> game. And that was game six. And why was it good? It was because they were running out of time and making mistakes, right? Right. Like running out of time and making mistakes makes for very interesting uh, viewing as a chess fan. And like, yeah, this other game, they played uh, two centipon average loss, but it was not riveting. It was absolutely riveting to watch two of the world's best chess players have less than a minute on their clock. It, it was relatable. It was yeah. exciting. And I think almost a dispositive piece of evidence for, for playing faster games in the world championship. Yeah. And you see it, you were mentioning that kind of like win probability graph almost, and you do see this like, shocking turns as, as moves get played. Yeah. And I don't, I, I'm certainly not uh, casting any judgment on the grandmasters who would and have destroyed me over the chessboard. But yeah, I think we saw, yeah, three or four blunders within a four or five sort of move window uh, yeah. driven entirely by the, by the time trouble. Yes. And this sort of very subtle sort of uh, early end game stuff that was going on that I could not uh, explain to you, even if you asked me, um, but yeah, just, I think slightly oversimplified explanation is that, that mistakes are human and, and we like, and we like to watch, we like to watch that. And, and as yeah. I kind of said at the beginning of our discussion, perfect play is, is very, um, is very impressive yeah. and like very easy to appreciate as a, as a fellow human, but sort of the mistakes I relate, I relate to, uh, a little bit more. Yeah. And it does bring you to the edge of your seat much quicker, I think, than than watching this perfection unfold throughout a long period of time. Um, so this the mistakes, I think, is also similar to um, an element of chance in a game. And that's another game that you talk about is backgammon. Um, and it introduces something that checkers and chess doesn't have, which is this this aspect of randomness or this, this chance factor. Um, how does that impact uh, the way that people play the games and the way that people are drawn to the game? Yeah, it's a great question. Backgammon is uh, interesting of the sort of unique of, in, of the games in the book, wh whereby before I started reporting, I had never really played much backgammon. And now I am utterly obsessed with backgammon. <laughs> I cannot recommend backgammon to anyone watching enough. I think it's absolutely fantastic yeah. uh, game. Um, yeah, so the games, uh, step back just a, a half step. The games yeah. in the book are um, uh, ordered um, purposefully. And the idea, although it's a bit of a rough one, is that each chapter and each game adds a sort of feature. So exactly as you say, as we move, I think, from the chapter on Go to the chapter on Backgammon, and we're adding a random element. When we get to poker, we add hidden information and so on. So the random element is the sort of first big, big difference from checkers, uh, chess, and go. And uh, I think that the impact of chance is affects different sort of interested parties differently. So there's like the, the new player, like me, the uh, elite player, um, like someone uh, named Mochi, who's the best player in the world, who I talked to for the book. I can talk a little bit about our conversation in a minute. And then the machine, how does it, how does it affect the machine? I think for the beginning player in a game like backgammon skill is the most beautiful part of it. Why? Because it 
is essentially a democratizing feature. I could play against the best player in the world and I could beat him or her. I would have a chance. And the luck element in backgammon is pretty healthy. I'm pulling this number out of the air, but maybe I could beat the best player in the world in a single game 30% of the time, something like that. Of course, that diminishes over the course of a match or whatever. Um, but that allows me sort of entree into backgammon, right? I'm in with a chance. I could never be the world's best chess player ever. I would get very frustrated and stop playing. And what this means for the beginner is, well, it's easy to find people to play with. Like I can teach my friends who have never played and uh, we can sort of get um, a, a group together very quickly. And indeed, that's what happened. Um, when I was reporting the book, I would play with people I met when I was on my, my fellowship a couple of years ago. All the fellows played and, you know, it was, um, it was this became the kind of game of, of that year because there was a, a way in via chance. And I obviously I should hasten to add there's a lot of skill too. There has to be skill. And, and the, the cocktail there is in backgammon is just perfect, I think, the the breakdown. Um, so that's how it affected affected me. It seemed like this very accessible game. How it affects the top players is I think, roughly speaking, they don't really think about it. Of course, they think about the probabilities, you know, they have to, but they don't think, oh, I got unlucky or I got lucky or there's chance. It's just, it is, it is what it is. The dice fall, how the dice fall, and you make the best move given the dice available to you and, and you move on. And, you know, I, I asked uh, Mochi, this, um, the best player in the world, sort of about what's it like to be a professional player in a game with so much chance? Like, how do you, how do you operate? It's just, I, I feel like I would be paralyzed. And he, he gave me roughly, roughly this, this same answer I was just describing. Like, it doesn't matter if you play enough games, you know, you have the uh, law of large numbers type argument. Like there is, there is no chance. And, you know, he's like, he's Mochi is equivalent to the house at the casino. Right. The house can lose in the short run. The house is never going to lose in the long run. And for I think for the machine, um, for the programs, uh, backgammon is, is pretty interesting. Backgammon is one of the first uh, really serious and successful applications of neural network ideas. Yes. Um, one of the reasons why it uh, appealed to uh, so Gerald Tesaro, who's at IBM, um, was one of the first to work on this really seriously. He's still there. I interviewed him for the book. And the, we were talking earlier about sort of the tree of a game, the possibilities as it, as it goes up. The branching factor, sort of how thickly the tree branches in backgammon is enormous right. because you can move um, your pieces a bunch of different ways, but you can also roll the dice a bunch of different ways, six times right. six, taking out this sort of... Um, uh, symmetrical roles that are operationally the same, but the branching factor is enormous. So these standard sort of quote unquote old fashioned search and evaluate techniques uh, were not very effective. But what turned out to be extremely effective was um, neural networks, which, you know, very loosely speaking, are very good at pattern recognition. And that's exactly how strong players play backgammon, not thinking through every single twig above them, but sort of recognizing a sort of broader pattern of, oh, I recognize this part of the tree kind of thing. And the computer turned out to be to be very good at it. So the injection of just a couple of dice sort of really um, sort of dramatically, um, uh, dra dramatic upheaval for, for kind of the flavor and the nature of a game. Yeah. Yeah, and it is interesting that point where we were talking about chess and the computer's approach is basically to go through and try to find these these pieces that are um, missing from human knowledge or mistaken from human knowledge. But backgammon, you, that, that's not really an approach that you can take. You have to take this this separate approach, which is um, to to develop an understanding of the patterns and, and the ways of playing. Um, and it's that, effective at both is quite interesting. Yeah, that's exactly right. So yeah, the, the literature on backgammon looks a lot different than the literature on chess, for example. So of course in chess, every game starts the same way and there's you know very well-established ways uh, to, to open, to begin a chess game, for example. And sure, there's a little bit of opening theory in backgammon, but maybe for what, the first couple moves. Right. But by then the tree has become so wide that, that one can't really, uh, one can't at all exhibit the sort of rote memorization we were talking about in chess. So you have to rely 
on yeah intuition and um and experience and um experience is is a really kind of crucial um part of getting good at backend so before there were computers the way that sort of pioneering backend and players got good was they started with a position they rolled the dice they played it out they rolled the dice they played it out then they started over at the same position all night and these are called unsurprisingly rollouts and they got a they got a feel for okay i have this position how does how does it tend to evolve how did the checkers tend to flow this way and that way around the board how often do i get hit etc um so yeah this sort of experience uh is a huge component of of backgammon um training yeah and the other interesting thing that you mentioned in your book about backgammon is that because there's this element of chance there's also this um element of suspicion from people that that the AI is cheating, that it's uh, kind of fudging the dice rolls. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, this is, seems to be like a, an utterly human response <laughs> to losing to a machine at a game of chance is like it's rigged. Right. Obviously, it's rigged. And this is a form of what we were talking about earlier. What like what is this machine doing here? It can't it can't do what I do um, right. at this game. And indeed, um, so the uh, XG Extreme Gammon is, is kind of the most popular um, backgammon uh, AI that you can kind of play play at home, and and you know I play it constantly on my phone to the detriment of like whatever it is I'm <laughs> supposed to be doing. Yeah. And yeah, when I started out, it's like this is rigged. These dice are rigged, and and I think you, you hear that a lot to the point where um, backgammon websites or programs. Uh, have disclaimers saying like, look, these we promise <laughs> right. we can prove it to you. And most of them even have settings where, sure, go ahead and roll your own dice at home, enter them into your computer right, and right. go from there if, if you really, really want to. So um, I think this is a natural kind of, um, uh, yeah, doubt, uh, delusional response to um, to losing to the machine. Yeah. Take, we'll take any excuse available to us. Yeah. Um, and... I wanted to talk briefly about um, the game of bridge and because it also has this interesting thing where um, so it's a card game where you have a partner and you have to um, attempt to form a strategy with your partner. Um, but there's you can't really communicate openly. There's some ways, some game elements that allow you to communicate information. Um, but compared to these other games, it seems like it's like absolutely rife for cheating. Um, it seems almost trivial to, to cheat at this game. How does that impact um, the way that people see the game and then also the way that AIs could perform in these games. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's sort of another very, very human response is like, how do I gain an edge in this game? I cheat. Right. Um, so yeah, you're only allowed to sort of communicate with your partner via um, the auction. This is a very structured thing that takes place before the card play in a hand. And you want to communicate what's in your own hand to your partner. And, but, you know, you could also do this by uh, coughing in a very specific way or kicking them under the table <laughs> or saying like uh, some code word that you had come up with. And of course, this is all very verboten. These are like the mortal sins right. of bridge, but people find find a way to do them. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the bridge world has really been rocked and to some extent decimated by, by this sort of ongoing scandal and revelation after revelation of what top pairs um, were uh, at least alleged uh, to have been cheating. Um, the the computer occupies sort of an interesting um, space in in a world uh, of of cheating humans, where of course games um, are often online now, right. and we play them online. And but this pre presents a unique problem for playing sort of honest bridge, which is where you know, Matt, if you and I are partners and we're playing online, I can call you on the phone and I can say, right. hey, I have, you know, the ace of spades <laughs> and the king and the whatever. Right. And this is obviously impossible to check for. So a, po a popular way to play bridge now is, you know, Matt, you partner with a robot and I, Oliver, partner with a robot and we play partnership that way. So the robots can sort of be proven to, you know, we can't call the robot up on the phone and we can play something that looks like, you know, a game of contract bridge that we're fairly sure is happening uh, above board. So this is um, this was the fate of one of the um, strongest bridge playing uh, AI systems. Uh, now it sort of um, lives on a bridge playing website and is uh, a partner, an available partner for for human players. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, 
Um, so we have some great audience questions that I want to jump to. Um, to start with, we have Jennifer who asks, do you have a favorite game and why? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, I'm going to hedge a little bit uh, <laughs> because, um, well, one, it changes over time. Right. You know, it's like asking someone to pick their favorite child. Right. Um, it changes over time, and I like uh, different games the most in, in different contexts. Um, but I'll name a few. Um, Scrabble was my favorite game for a long time. Uh, I played far, far too much Scrabble in graduate school, um, played sort of the Scrabble tournament scene. And, and I like it because it's the game that I personally am best at and sort of understand as a player most deeply. Uh, so I like it for that reason. Um, as I mentioned before, backgammon, like really, really uh, a love affair between me and backgammon that has sort of blossomed in a very, very short amount of time. And it just makes me sad because I wish I had started playing much, much earlier. And I think it's, as I mentioned before, a like, perfectly blended mix of, of luck and skill available to anyone who wants to play a perfect example of the sort of minute to learn, lifetime to master uh, kind of idea. And third, um, chess. Chess is a very sort of um, nostalgic, romantic, um, uh, occupies that place in my brain. I yeah, played it uh, since I was a little kid with my grandpa. And uh, so it was a game. It was a game I grew up on. Unfortunately, never got good, never got good. But um, I have extremely fond memories of, of playing chess growing up. So those are three for, for three uh, slightly different reasons. Yeah, and somewhat related, we have a question from Elliot who says, what do you think makes great tabletop players so great? Um, moving chess pieces, playing cards isn't mechanically difficult like a golf swing, yet there are clear skill gaps even among elite players. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I think there, there's, there's two sort of, I could break that into two questions. What makes someone willing to become elite at a game? Right. And to, uh, and put in that time and effort and what are the like sort of much finer distinctions between and among elite players i think you know, probably unsatisfactory answer is just like you have to really love the game like whatever that means like that doesn't even mean you like it right <laughs> you just have to love it like you just yeah. have to like be driven to spend a lot of time and, and every game in the book requires just uncountably large number of, of hours devoted to it whether it's learning scrabble words, uh, whether it's memorizing chess openings or end game uh, tactics or, or whatever. So just, I think it's sort of inexplicable. Like, why did I spend, you know, these 10,000 hours studying Scrabble words? I have, I have no idea. Yeah. And it's sort of a, a meditative thing for me. Yeah. The gradations between the, the, the best players in the world. I don't know. Um, I don't think I have a good answer. Inexplicable quirks of history and culture and time usage. And I don't know, a, a million, yeah. a million things that I don't think I can untangle, but I, yeah. I will say, I wish I was better at every game in my book <laughs> than, than I am. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, so the next question we have is from Hiba who asks, have you ever explored games played by older civilizations? Any common ground between games then and now? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, I've I've dug into it insofar as the a few of the games in my book have very ancient uh, ancestors. So, um, for example, in uh, in my backgammon chapter opens with a, a, a legion of Egyptologists sort of smashing into this ancient burial tomb and finding surprise surprise a backgammon set very very similar to a modern backgammon. Um, Chet, chess has, I think, a 1500 year history, um, likely developed as sort of an uh, ancient, like miniaturized military exercise that comported with the pieces of the Indian uh, army of, of that day. Uh, Go is, you know, millennia old. Checkers has millennia old ancestors. And um, it's hard to sort of trace exactly, you know, the path from my kitchen table back to like ancient Egypt, but the evidence is incontrovertible that ancient peoples uh, played games extremely similar to the games that we play today. Um, so there's a, yeah, a bit of a discussion about that in the book, but I think 
what's most interesting to me about that question is like the games that were played in bygone cities of ruined empires are now played by like the most advanced supercomputers and processors um, that we've built, right? Like this sort of cultural and technological longevity, I think games are, are unparalleled. And I find that like utterly fascinating uh, sort of thread that, that connects humans. Yeah. And the thread of human accomplishment that has led from the creation of this game through to the creation of these systems that can, can bring more to the game. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And one, one point I'm, I'm very careful to make in the book is there is no such thing as human versus machine, right? The, it's very important to, to remember that humans built these machines sometimes at great cost, personal cost, financial cost, time cost. And, I hope you find in the book that some of the most colorful human characters are the technologists, the programmers, the engineers. And I was very careful to sort of, to put it, Matt, exactly like you did. These, these superhuman games playing machines are not, you know, the end of us. They're <laughs> just, uh, I think they're emblematic of, of the, the genius of us. Yes. Uh, so going on from there, um, David asks, feelings on text slash trivia games like Jeopardy? Um, I love I love Jeopardy. I don't watch it as much as I used to, um, but I, I've taken the Jeopardy test a handful of times, never made it past that. So that's always been, that's an uncrossed off uh, bucket list <laughs> item. But of course, even there, you have a, a really fascinating um, uh human versus human stroke machine story. Um, and indeed, uh, Gerald Tesaro, who worked on Backgam and also worked on some of the, the bidding strategy for Watson, which played on Jeopardy and the amazing uh, Jeopardy run, which has uh, just come to an end. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would say I, like most of the games in my book, I appreciate them uh, very, very much, but I'm, I myself am not, am not a master of trivia. Yeah, that's right. It is interesting, like you say, that there has been this element of the strategy that humans employ has changed in the post uh, AI playing that game world. It's yeah, really and as I understand it, um, my, if my memory serves, it had a lot to do with daily double, daily yeah. double wagering, and essentially um, the computer saying uh, you should be a lot more aggressive, among other things. I think um, you can go back, and indeed, um, I have for a story that I wrote and find out, you know, where are the daily doubles historically? And they yeah. tend to obviously be in, in the lower rows and so on. And yeah, this sort of computer, yes, but also just data analysis driven approach to, to the games in my book, to Jeopardy, to baseball, to other right. sports um, has been really broad based. And yeah, we, I think it's, it's really interesting to watch this broad-based sort of um, rising tide lifts all boats like skill effect where everybody's just getting a lot better and to see how the games change as a result of that. Like ba like basketball, for example, looks a lot different now than it did a decade ago or two decades ago, whatever. Definitely, yeah. And, and Morgan has a question that touches on this a bit, which is, um, or oh, sorry, Ali has a question. Uh, what is the difference between games and sports? Where do they meet? Where do they differ? Yeah, it's it's a good question, and it's one that I, I frankly I don't I don't really care about. Like I think, right. and I, I I don't mean any offense to the asker of the question. It's a very good question. <laughs> it's important to think about. But you know, is chess a sport? Sure. Like, why not? Is basketball a game? Sure. Why not? And these are very these are very slippery concepts. And sort of um, the the definition I offer in the book, uh, and I sort of introduce this character, Bernard Suits, who is a philosopher, sort of a philosopher of games. And he called games the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. That was his entire definition. Right. So I think chess fits into that, right? I could put the queen over here and put you in checkmate, but I have to follow these, you know, unnecessary rules to do that. Yeah. Basketball, I could, you know, run down the court and knock people out of the way and, and dunk the ball, but I can't do that because, you know, there are rules and yeah, they're all games. They're all sports. I think they all, as we were just talking about in the last question, you know, are these, this sort of pocket of human pursuit that sort of shares a lot of characteristics and has, has sort of evolved as we've, um, as we've gained knowledge about them. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, so the question that Morgan was asking is, do you ever play more modern board games? What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I used to do um, quite a bit. I've been uh, with like reporting and writing the book, I've been playing the games in, in the book. I feel like it was important to get a flavor of them as I was writing about them. I think if you were, you know, just like if you were writing about Van Gogh, you'd probably like pin some Van Gogh prints to your wall or something. So I've been really deeply immersed in the games in the book. Um, yeah, I used to like every other sort of American my age, uh, played a lot of Settlers of Catan. Uh, for Christmas, I received uh, Wingspan, uh, which I played with my family, which is a very popular new board game. Um, Terraforming Mars, another another recent acquisition. So I, while I haven't played them a ton recently, I, I appreciate what's happening. And again, over the last what decade or so, this this golden age of of board game design that has, roughly speaking, sort of migrated from from Europe to the U.S. and and I think you know it's probably unsurprising to hear me say that anything that increases people playing games, I think, is <laughs> to the good, without limit. Um, so yeah, uh, hu huge fan of developments in that world. Yeah. Yeah, so we're just about out of time. I wanna wrap up with your thoughts on what it means for us as humans playing games in a world where computers are dominant in the ways that they are in many games. Yeah, fantastic question. And, and I think on the one hand, it, it doesn't mean much. And on the, on the, on the other hand, it means, it means everything. Like, so I'll try to explain what I mean. So there's a bit in the book about you know, Usain Bolt doesn't care that there's a race car that's much faster than he is. Right. This kind of idea where, you know, at, by this point, Magnus Carlsen probably doesn't care that, you know, Stockfish or Alpha Zero or whatever it is, is better than him. This is just sort of accepted fact about the way technology works. Um, but I think that it means a lot in another sense, which is it's extraordinarily, it's, they these t collectively are an extraordinary extraordinarily impressive technological feat that i think we ought to reflect on and, and be proud of as a human collective of human brains and i think the big question which is um more or less unanswered is well what will these games playing machines programs systems etc do in the so-called real world Right. So you had extreme examples like uh, IBM's Deep Blue, which was disassembled right after it beat Kasparov in 97 and did literally nothing else. Right. But you have these more modern neural network deep learning techniques that seem to maybe be sort of more adaptable and more sort of extendable to other to other domains. Um, so I think, you know, since the 1950s, if not before that, games have been a test bed and a launching pad for AI that has sort of as of yet failed to sort of uh, achieve its promise right. but i think that's changing and i think to see what role games play in as a foundation for our future will be really fascinating to watch yeah that's excellent so that's all the time that we have oliver i want to thank you again for joining us it's been really a lot of fun having you here thank you so much for having me Oliver's book, Seven Games, A Human History, is available now wherever books are sold, including through your local and independent bookseller. If you've ever played a game or a tabletop game, uh, I guarantee you'll like this book, so check it out. For everyone who joined us today, we look forward to seeing you at our next Toxic Google event. Please stay safe and take care.